Hey guys, welcome to Poor Man Mods. This and this are not supposed to fit the Mark III Supra. And in this video, they're gonna fit the Mark III Supra. didn't die. <laughs> you thought it was going to explode. Huh? So what the heck did I just do there? <laughs> so if you watched a couple videos ago, back in the winter, I talked about how I was unhappy with how soft the rear suspension was in this car, and I do not want to do coilovers. I want to stay away from them. It had Eibach lowering springs all the way around, and then it also had in the rear some aftermarket stiffer shock that was like 30% stiffer than factory. And the front, I have two Kiko Blues. Well, I was unhappy with how soft the rear was, so I originally tried to get stiffer Coney rear shocks, which was an absolute disaster. I don't recommend getting Coney rear shocks for the rear of a Mark III Supra ever. Stay away from them. So then I got uh, RSR lowering springs, which on paper had a higher spring rate than the iBox, and they did. But they also lowered the car a bit more so then it was squatting. So when I drove it, I was pretty much happy with the stiffness of those springs, but it did drop the car after settling, after settling like another half inch. So then the car was squatting. So even though it was stiffer, it was lower to the ground. And the main reason I wanted the car to be stiffer was since I did the rear wide fenders and wider wheels, now, when I hit big bumps on the road, even though I totally molested the rear fenders, the stock fender will karate chop the wheel because the wheels are bigger and they're out further and yeah. So I wanted to stiffen up the rear to avoid karate chopping on the wheel. Well, I was happy with the stiffness of those RSR springs, but now the car was even lower. So uh, I recently did a drive with this car uh, like a two hour drive round trip with me and a passenger and then just a little bit of cargo in the rear and The joints on the highway when I would hit them. I would still karate chop the tires pretty bad And I'm trying to prepare this car for the 5,000 mile round trip drive to Supra's in Vegas So I don't want to be karate chopping the wheels the entire time out there. I'm gonna have even more luggage so I wanted to lift the rear of this car and I originally tried ordering like RAV4 uh, coil spring spacers or isolators or something, and they were actually too small for the rear springs on this car. Like they would just go right in the middle of the spring. So I was just browsing through Amazon and looking at different coil spring spacers and came across a set, I shit you not, for a Dodge Ram 1500. And in one of the pictures, it provided the specs for the spacer, the inside and outside diameter of the spacer and where the coil spring would go. And turns out the inside diameter was absolutely perfect to slide in the rear coil spring for the 1988 Toyota Supra. So that thing fit absolutely perfect. The outside diameter of, was the same diameter as the top hat for the spring, for the shock. So it fit right into the body for a Dodge Ram 1500, it fit absolutely perfect. No modification needed. So now if you want to lift the rear of your Supra one inch, all you need is a Dodge Ram coil spring spacer. And it's for the front of a Dodge Ram. 
Now, I don't understand where these companies get lift kit numbers and stuff. Like, it's advertised as a two inch lift and it lifted the rear one inch. And when I worked at CJ Pony Parts installing lift kits on trucks, every time I would do a two inch lift, they would give us a one inch spacer and it would lift the truck an inch. So I don't know if they're like adding both sides, one and one equals two. I don't know, I don't know where the math comes from, but these companies can't math. So I put a two inch spacer in the back that was only an inch thick and it raised the rear an inch, but I'm happy with it. It raised it and it actually made it stiffer since it went between the top hat and the spring. It added a little bit of preload to the spring to stiffen it up. So it raised the car and stiffened it and I did take it for a drive, totally happy with it. <laughs> and uh, I think the stance is okay too. It's got a bit of a rake now, but I'd rather have a rake look than a squatting look. Squat just looks stupid. So I am pleased with that, especially for the price. So now after lifting the rear and all the techno toy tuning arms I did and everything, I can finally get this thing aligned for the drive out to Las Vegas. But there's more things I wanna do. I wanna put a better alternator in this. Uh, I, had, I recently did an upgraded head unit and put a subwoofer in this car. And I have a Walboro 440 fuel pump, uh, electric fans. And if I have the blower going, it's a pretty big draw on the electrical system because the stock alternator in these, they're only like 80 or 90 amps. And that's just not cutting it. So today we're gonna fix that. So this is an alternator for, what is it for? This is an alternator for a 2005 Lexus SC430. There's a couple different alternator upgrade options that you can attempt to install on the Jay-Z here. Um, there's aftermarket ones that bolt right up without any modification that put out a ton of power. But like I said, the stock one on these 1Js, they're only like 80 or 90 amps. And I think same thing goes for the older 2Js. And I did a little bit of looking around and some people said that the alternator off of like a V8 Sequoia or 4Runner will bolt up uh, with minor modifications but the wiring for their plug is like a, a four wire plug. So the wiring is just a tiny bit more involved. And where I was buying my alternators from, the Sequoia and Forerunner one was just a few dollars more. And then I went and looked up an SC430 alternator because the UZs, the, the engines, they're pretty much the same layout, the one UZ, two UZ, three UZ. So the Forerunner and Sequoia are gonna have the two UZ so I looked up a Lexus SC430, which has a 3UZ in it. So it should be the same general bolt pattern for the alternator. And this remand AC Delco was just a few dollars cheaper than the one for the Sequoia and 4Runner. It's probably gonna depend on where you shop. But what sold me on this one, if I can get it to work, is the wiring is the same for a lot of 2Js. It's just the typical three-prong pigtail for this alternator. Whereas the Sequoia and Forerunner, it was a four prong connector. So if you have a Jay-Z alternator in your car already with this uh, oval three prong connector, you won't need to mess with your wiring at all. You'll just have to mechanically make this fit. My 1J unfortunately has a round plug, so I will have to cut and splice the wiring. But luckily where I bought it from, Rock Auto, they supply freaking the wiring pin out in the pictures for these. So um, I should be able to easily just cut and splice the wires from my round plug to this one. But yeah, so that's why I'm gonna try this SC430 alternator over the Sequoia or even an older Jay-Z alternator because this is 130 amps, not 100, not 110, but this was a 130 amp alternator with the three wire connector. So should be less wiring, should be pretty simple to install. There's just a little thing that we have to mechanically manipulate and it should bolt up and give us a bunch more power. Where I bought this alternator from, Rock Auto, they did not have the pigtail for the alternator. I got this from Napa and I will provide the part number for it. Both of these websites are really good tools, even if you don't order the parts from them. Um, a lot of the research that I do for figuring out what parts fit what, or what might fit, and you know, which cars have what parts, is Rock Auto and Napa. Like, if you go to Rock Auto and look up parts, 
they give you research tools um, for totally free. Like if you look up a brake rotor, it's gonna provide you the specs for everything, thickness, diameter, inside diameter. They always give you a ton of specs for all the parts and you can use that to your advantage. So like when I was looking up alternators, it tells you the amperage and it tells you bolt hole sizes for some things and it gives you the diagram for the pinout. It gives you a lot of information and both Rock Auto and Napa also do a reverse lookup automatically and if you pull up a part, like this alternator, it'll automatically tell you what other vehicles this parts, what other vehicles that this part fits, which that is a very powerful tool as well. So if you ever need to do research on parts, uh, look at things that might fit, might work, uh, things that you're possibly interested in, use those two websites and use those tools to your advantage. Um, it's pretty invaluable. So I'm gonna get the old alternator out of this car and uh, show you what needs to be modified to make this bad boy fit. And then hopefully we can make it fit and make more power, electric power. Definitely wanna make sure your battery is disconnected before touching your alternator. You don't wanna weld your stuff. Here are the mounting locations for the alternator for the 1J and the 2J. And as you can see, this alternator has the same ones. There's this additional bracket, which is not used and you do not need to modify this. You can leave it alone if you want. So this should bolt right up, should be the same bolt pattern, but we do have to trim something on the back here. And of course, I'm gonna swap over my nice fancy pulley because this looks better than black in my opinion. Here are the back side of the alternators, very similar. This positive post is just at a slightly different angle than the post for the SC430 alternator. This one is actually, it looks like it's further down a little bit, should not be an issue at all. Um, and as you can see, I have the round three plug here, and this is the oval, I guess, three plug. So I'll show you the diagram, and then uh, we just got to wire this into my harness, and then that should, electronically make it work. Let me show you what we mechanically have to do. So these mounting tabs right here are the same thickness. So this tab is okay. It's this one that needs to be modified. So this one is right around 30 millimeters. And this one is 38 millimeters. So we will start off with taking five millimeters off. That's what people have said about the Sequoia and for runner alternator, it's definitely better to take less off than too much. So we'll start off with just taking five. So we'll go from 38 to 33. An angle grinder should make pretty easy work of this. All right, got this to 33 millimeters. We'll put it on the car, see how the alignment is, and uh, go from there. Hopefully we don't have to take any more off, but if we can, shouldn't be a problem. Before I put it on the car, I'm gonna swap pulleys though and put my blue one on here. But to get this off, you need a 10 millimeter and then an O2 sensor socket actually. For some reason, I have to hammer on the 10. Every other socket, even standard ones are too loose. and you take an O2 sensor socket and that actually goes on the nut. There we go.
That looks pretty good to me. Looks pretty good to me. I think I will leave it right here and I'll drive it. And if I see if the belt is wearing or squeaking, I'll make an adjustment, but I think it's good for now. We'll move on to the electrical. Okay, we're pretty much gonna be doing this one wire at a time and I'll have a diagram on the screen so you can see what I'm referring to. Uh, but these diagrams, they are showing you the pin on the alternator, not on the connector. So you don't wanna be looking at the connectors like this. We're gonna be looking at the back side because they're referring to the pins on the alternator. We're gonna go one by one here. So we'll start with the sense wire and the sense wire on my round plug is the top wire of my oval plug. And so that is gonna go to the left pin on this connector. If you have the push clip up top, it's gonna be on the left. Now we'll work on the ignition positive wire, which is the bottom left wire here, labeled IG on the diagram. And that is gonna be going to the middle wire on this connector. Our third wire should be pretty obvious. Can't mess this up. Wow, I think maybe that could have been my problem. <laughs> that wire just broke off the connector. Uh, okay. <laughs> Good thing I'm replacing this. That connector was on its last leg, apparently. That literally just fell off. And lastly, we'll put some fancy loom on here to make your shit-tastic wiring job look professional. That's how you trick people into thinking you're good at wiring. Put some good-looking loom on your stuff, pretty soon people start thinking you're a master electrician. Look how professional that looks. God damn. Now we'll plug her in and see if she works. The easiest way to see if your alternator is working properly is to put a voltmeter on your electrical system when the alternator is running. So right now, if I turn the key on, this is a cigarette lighter phone charger with two USB ports on it, but there's also a volt gauge on it. You probably can't see it, but right now it's saying 10.9 volts. I've got the fuel pump running. I turn that off, it goes up to 11.3. If the alternator is working, we should be in the high 13s or low 14s when I turn the engine on. So let's give that a try. All right, so in this video, we got two things to fit my Mark III Super that are not supposed to fit the Mark III Supra. I got those ridiculous Ram 1500 coil spring spacers in the rear, lifted the rear an inch, made it a little bit stiffer, and now it should be good to go for a long, for a long road trip with some cargo in the rear, I'm hoping. And I upgraded my alternator. So the main reason I wanted to upgrade my alternator was over the past couple weeks or so, um, I noticed if I was sitting there in the car idling with my radio playing, because I recently added that subwoofer, at night with the headlights on, the gauge cluster lights would flicker, like there was enough power getting supplied to the car. And I didn't, I didn't really think about it, um, but the stock alternators in these don't put out much power. And now that I have a larger fuel pump, a much larger fuel pump that pulls a lot of current, and that head unit and subwoofer, that pulls a lot of power too. And it's just a small underseat amp and sub combo, but that still is, but that's still a draw on the system. And then I had the headlights going. And so that, you know, wasn't powering the car enough. And 
When I would rev it, the gauge cluster lights wouldn't flicker anymore, but at an idle, it couldn't keep up. And my volt gauge showed around 13, four volts with the car idling, which I would like to see that a little bit higher, but the gauge cluster lights were not flickering. And I turned on the radio, I turned on the fuel pump, because the car was running. And I also turned on the radiator fans and the blower. And voltage was stable at 13.4 and the gauge cluster lights were not flickering. So this thing is definitely putting out more power than the old alternator. It's rated at 130 amps, but who the heck knows? I have no way to test that. But as far as I could see, the gauge cluster lights are more stable than with the older alternator. So I'm happy. And this alternator, the plug that I switched to, there's a lot more options. Uh, with that round plug, you're really limited to your alternator options. So I'm glad to have this new pigtail connector on there. Um, if I were to change it in the future, uh, there's a lot more alternator options that will fit. Um, not just the SC430, but different JZ alternators will fit. There'll be lower amperage, but also other UZ alternators will work too. So this is just a better design all around. And I hope this can help some of you out if you're looking to upgrade your alternators. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you learned something or at least thought something about this was interesting. So uh, thank you for watching. Definitely hit that like button, subscribe, all that good stuff. That'll help me out a bunch. And uh, I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks.